Um, welcome. Bienvenidos, Again, bienvenidos de vuelta, de nuevo, ¿cierto? Nos reunimos en un día maravilloso que hemos tenido. Soy Sir Guy George, soy presidente de Estoy muy contenta de poder dar la bienvenida de todo y también a nuestro orador que este año Srinivasara Mudan será la conferencia de La conferencia de Srinivasara será va a querer destacar la charla esencial. Lecture is named after Srinivas Aravamudan, who several of you know and who is a friend to many of us, but um, for whom many of you probably also don't know, is for um, many years Srinivas was the president of the consortium, uh, um, and he abruptly fell ill and passed away um, towards the far end of his, his term as president. Um, among the many things that Srinivas did, Uh, as president was help us find our way to this very room today, this very auditorium today. Um, many years ago, and Pablo, I forget the year, it was probably 2015, um, I, Srinivas and I were invited to a meeting in Buenos Aires um, that was hosted by a sister consortium, the International Consortium of Critical Theory, And um, it's really at that moment that our conversations with colleagues in Chile, our conversations with colleagues in Buenos Aires and in other parts of, um, the, um, of the region began. Um, but it was Srinivas's commitment to an international consortium, and by international he meant not only international within the Anglophone world, um, but a multilingual consortium that is really how we ended up together over this past week in these conversations. So um, this, the purpose of this um, kind of distinguished lecture for CHCI is both to honor uh, his memory and his contribution to the consortium and also register the many ways in which that aspiration is still very, very much alive. So um, I'm pleased to welcome you all here and I think Moritz will um, be introducing this evening's speaker. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Moritz um, van Beverdonke from the University of the Western Cape. Um, when, when, uh, when I spoke with um, Andres this morning and he asked me to do the introduction this evening, I promptly went and wrote a three-hour three dissertation on, uh, on Mitzadra's work. So buckle in. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> It's my honor and pleasure to briefly introduce Sandro Metsadra this evening. Metsadra is a professor of political philosophy and theory at the University of Bologna and is adjunct fellow at the Institute for Culture and Society of the University of Western Sydney. He has been visiting professor and research fellow in several places, like the New School for Social, Social Research and the Franklin Humanities Institute, Institute at Duke University, where he was part of the Social Movements Lab. Um, Mitsadra is on the editorial boards of numerous journals, including such titles as Emancipations, Politics, Dialogues in Human Geography, and Critical Times. He is the author and co-author of far too many books for me to recount, many of them with Brett Nielsen. Some of the most influential of these, at least in the location from which I speak in South Africa, are his Border as Method and the Politics of Operation. It's not just because those are the ones in English. <laughs> Has a <laughs> it plays a role. Um, Metsadra's work has been important for scholars of both political and post-colonial theory, as well as for those contending with the multiple expressions of sovereignty at work in our contemporary world. I first encountered Metsadra in his work while developing a graduate seminar on the concept of global apartheid in 2014 with Cesare Casarino, and then had the privilege of sitting in on a workshop he delivered on border as method at the University of Minnesota in 2016. <clears throat> For many of us, it is Metsadra's astute ability to reconstellate the terms around which and through which concepts come to be articulated 
that makes his work so important. His recent work has centered on the relations, relations between globalization, migration, and capitalism, on contemporary capitalism, as well as on post-colonial criticism. He participates in the post-workerist debates, being one of the founders of the website Euro Nomad. In South Africa, Mitsadra's work has produced a way of thinking and the terms for such a practice that offers a different engagement with what we might call the infrastructures of our present. His rethinking of concepts such as that of the migrant, transit labor, and the autonomy of migration have been critical for reimagining how we understand both the, under the enduring legacies of colonialism, the ambivalent creative forces that reside in that, as well as the discourses through which Europe and its monstrous manifestations narrate themselves, located in his critique of the desire that underwrites a project like Fortress Europe, for example. These interventions have importantly drawn on the, con on the conceptual work of Balibar and others, Hart and Negri, um, and so he's in that, that lineage. Mitsadra's articulation and thinking of method, where it emerges from the material circumstances at hand, and our work on puppetry in the CHR, which plays with the sense of the at hand and the border between the human and the object, was incredibly important for the seminar Cesare and I taught on global apartheid and for much of the work on political theory and subjectivation that has been done in the CHR. Lastly, it's my privilege to be able to announce that as of today, Metsadra has been named the International Chair of Philosophy in the University of Paris for 2024. And welcome, Metsadra. Thank you so much for these uh, kind uh, words. Mm. I will uh, speak English, but uh, I'm happy to switch to Spanish in the discussion. Uh, I will have something to say about Latin America, so maybe Spanish uh, is uh, the most uh, adequate uh, language uh, for uh, the discussion. Mm. I will read the paper. I usually do not like to do that. It was not part of my training, of my academic training in Italy. You know, in Italy, you have to show up and provide a bit of theater, so you have to improvise. So I'm not particularly good at reading papers, but I will do my best. And allow me to start by uh, warmly thanking the organizers of this meeting for uh, inviting me, and uh, particularly Constanza Rivano for managing uh, the whole uh, logistics of travel uh, and stay. My personal thank uh, goes to Ranjana Kanna, who first reached out to me, and uh, although she could not uh, travel to Santiago, I'm kind of moved to deliver today the Zrinivas uh, Aravamudan Memorial Lecture on Ranji's uh, invitation, because uh, I know what uh, it means uh, to her uh, in terms of sorrow and love. So no matter how it will turn out to be, my talk is dedicated uh, to uh, Ranji, even uh, beyond uh, honoring the memory of an exceptional scholar uh, who, among other things, as we heard, uh, played prominent roles uh, in the history of uh, CHCI. Uh, Recent uh, decades, uh, we read uh, in the call uh, for this conference, uh, have been marked by civil uprisings and revolts in uh, various regions of the world. And we heard uh, uh, in the morning uh, something about uh, uh, these uh, uprisings. Mm -hmm. A radical focus on the present has characterized uh, those uprisings uh, and revolts, while a future orientation based on strategy, organization, and leadership is often lacking. I quote from the call. Commotion, distance, and construction of the common 
are uh, the conceptual keywords uh, that frame our deliberations uh, in uh, Santiago these days. I will tackle these uh, questions from a specific angle in this uh, lecture. In an age of uh, pandemic uh, and war, I will uh, attempt to provide uh, at least uh, the prolegomena for uh, a rethinking of uh, internationalism. Mm -hmm. Which means that my focus will be on what the uprisings and struggles of recent decades have in common, mm -hmm. despite their uh, huge uh, heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. In doing so, I will share with you, and in a way test, some ideas I have been uh, recently elaborating again with uh, Brett Nielsen uh, for a new book we have just finished uh, to write, significantly entitled The Rest and the West. Mm. And rethinking internationalism is the urgent and difficult uh, task uh, we outline in this book uh, based uh, on an analysis uh, of the mutations of global capitalism, again, in an age of pandemic uh, and war. We are facing a disruption of uh, the so-called rules-based uh, international system that challenges established forms of liberal internationalism and corresponding cosmopolitan ideologies. Such a disruption signals deeper shifts within the capitalist world system that we need to carefully investigate to test the potentialities, the virtuality of a different form of uh, internationalism rooted in the long history of anarchist, socialist, and communist uh, solidarity. To repeat, we are living through a tumultuous transition at the global level with uh, momentous implications at local as well as uh, national and regional uh, scales. The main question behind my engagement in uh, a rethinking of internationalism regards the possibility and conditions of a radical politics of struggles beyond the nation capable to unfold within and against that transition to occupy and in a way to hijack it. Such a question is not new, although employing a different conceptual language, it is at stake in debates surrounding cosmopolitanism since the 1990s and in critical elaborations surrounding the notion of the planet in the age of Anthropocene, Capitalocene. Hmm. But closer to my own theoretical approach uh, and also political experiences, uh, allow me to mention as uh, an antecedent of uh, my engagement with uh, internationalism today, Michael Hart uh, and Tony Negri's uh, empire that, uh, as you may know, came out in the year 2000. I do not want to rehearse uh, discussions uh, about uh, kind of theoretical framework of uh, this book uh, now. What seems more interesting to me is what Hart and Negri call the paradox of uh, incommunicability, which means the fact that, I quote, in our much celebrated age of communication, struggles have become all but incommunicable, 
end of quote. While this could be presented as a paradox uh, in a conjuncture that appeared uh, to be characterized by powerful vectors of uh, unification of the world market and the globe, it continues to haunt us facing the deep fractures, tensions, and conflicts crisscrossing global capitalism today. This does not mean, as I will show later, that uh, cross-border processes of communication, circulation, and translation among uh, struggles do not uh, exist in uh, the contemporary world. The opposite is the case, but these processes continue to encounter bottlenecks and the myriad of obstacles that must be considered if we are to rethink internationalism as a political force and a power factor. But uh, I have to say something uh, about uh, the very notion of uh, internationalism. I do not know if this name remains valid uh, today. And there are at least uh, two reasons behind my hesitation. Firstly, the history of uh, internationalism in the 20th century is characterized by memorable episodes uh, of solidarity across countries and continents that may be instantiated with uh, geographical names uh, such as Spain and uh, Vietnam. Nonetheless, it is also true that uh, communist uh, internationalism has served too often as an instrument to cover up for the national interests of uh, the Soviet uh, Union with catastrophic implications in the age of Stalin and the name Spain is of course again uh, redolent here. Such implications cast a shadow on the very name internationalism. Secondly, and even more importantly, there is a need to stress that uh, in the history of internationalism, it has been taken for granted that the unit of organization was provided by the nation. Consider that when uh, Marx started to work about this topic in uh, the 1840s, the process of uh, nationalization of the state and of the political map uh, was far from accomplished in Europe. Internationalism was an extraordinary political invention and anticipation, as no less than Jacques Derrida stresses with respect to a movement that, I quote Derrida, presented itself as geopolitical, thereby inaugurating the space that is now ours and that today is reaching its limits, the limits of the earth and the limits of the political. Well, we have reached those limits. And we may need another political invention foreshadowing a variable geometry of spaces for political action beyond the nation and an intertwining of those spaces through organizational and even institutional processes of networking. But what remains with us, what I will talk about in this lecture is the problem addressed by internationalism. Simply put, the forging of a political language capable to address heterogeneous conditions of domination and exploitation in different parts of the world while articulating a common desire for liberation. 
the historical archives of international of internationalism remain sources of inspiration for us, above all regarding political experiences, uh, I'm thinking of Pan-Africanism, for instance, that test the limits of the nation as the privileged scale for uh, organizing, as well as what I like to call uh, resonances of struggles across uh, nations and uh, continents. I would be delighted to pursue this line of uh, historical excavations and we can uh, come back to this point in uh, the discussion, of course. But now I must come uh, to the challenges of uh, our present, which might be hard to tackle, but build the crucial test for the rethinking of the problem of uh, internationalism. In doing so, I follow from the viewpoint of method uh, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin's passionate restlessness during uh, the Great War, his attempt to come to terms with the historical novelty of imperialism to reframe basic aspects of communist politics in Russia and uh, on uh, the world uh, scale. To be clear, I do not think that Lenin's theory of imperialism is particularly helpful for us uh, today. It belongs to history, to the history of ideas and politics. But his fight to include uh, geopolitical factors within his understanding of uh, class struggle in a conjuncture of unprecedented war and large-scale massacres in Europe remains, I repeat, methodically inspiring. It is precisely this articulation between quote-unquote geopolitics and social struggles that uh, becomes again crucial today in a completely different uh, situation. How to make sense uh, of the fractures and conflicts of the international uh, system in the current conjuncture is a question that haunts many scholars, disciplines, and public debates. In the West, the prevailing uh, answers uh, center upon such catchphrases as the end of uh, globalization with the related uh, reshoring, nearshoring, decoupling and the like and uh, the new Cold War. Already circulating uh, during uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, such rhetoric has gained even more momentum in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. In our recent work, Brett Nielsen and I take a critical stance on this rhetoric. And we demonstrate that global processes continue to shape capitalism across diverse geographical scales, although the homogeneous characters of uh, these uh, global processes translate onto heterogeneous formations when they hit the ground due to the encounter with a panoply of dynamics of political, legal, territorial, and cultural variegation. Brett and I follow Giovanni Arrighi and other world system uh, scholars in their diagnosis of the crisis of uh, the US global hegemony, but uh, we remain wary of any prospect of a straightforward uh, hegemonic uh, transition, say, to China as the new emerging uh, hegemon. And this is because uh, our analysis of contemporary capitalism points to a set of processes and logics. 
to a rationality driving processes of uh, valorization and uh, accumulation of capital that exist in tension with what uh, Arrighi calls uh, territorialism. Such a tension is not new, of course, but we contend that today such tensions and gaps are intensified to the point of rupture. And this hypothesis uh, provides us uh, with uh, a crucial point of entry into the analysis of multipolarity, a concept that we use to describe the current global predicament, remaining aware of its controversial nature. This means that we do not only take a radical distance from the usage of multipolarity by the Putin regime and its ideologues, like for instance, Alexander Dugin's civilizational inflection of the, of the concept. We also take a distance from the variations on the language of polarity in international relations, where states, nations, and great powers are usually considered the exclusive actors in world politics. To the contrary, we stress the role played in the very constitution of multipolarity by capitalist actors and operations, while we carefully investigate what we call the operative spaces they create, for instance, in the fields of logistics and energy distribution, infrastructures, digitalization, and finance. Such spaces intersect and uh, even intermingle with the territorial boundaries circumscribing uh, states and nations, but they can never be reduced to them or to the emerging poles of uh, the contemporary world. This is why we agree with Adam Tooze when uh, he speaks of a centrifugal multipolarity not simply, as Tu says, because of the lack of a corresponding order, but also, as we add, because operations of capital structurally decenter the process of pole formation. We understand such process, the process of pole formation, as open and far from being accomplished. We also emphasize that, while far from being exclusive, territorial logics do crisscross the constitution of Poles. If you take Russia, it is clear that in Putin's vision of a gross realm for the Russian world and economy, territorial concerns and even an imperialist design of expansion are clearly prevailing. But a territorial reduction of the complexity of processes of pole formation is possible also beyond the Russian case. And it can lead to a simplification of international tensions within a logic of confrontation and war. Far from being uh, an accurate uh, description of the current state uh, of relations between the US and China, the rhetoric of uh, the new Cold War can work as a weapon in this uh, direction, with willing actors ready to embrace it, uh, both in Washington and uh, in uh, Beijing. It is against uh, this background that uh, also the Ukraine war should be critically analyzed. Stressing the related proliferation of uh, what we call war regimes in many parts of the world, including Europe and East Asia. 
the mobilization against the Ukraine war to stop the violence, terror, and devastation that civilian populations have endured since Russia's invasion builds, therefore, a struggle to stop the prospect of future inter-imperialist wars. Imperialism, let's talk uh, very quickly about imperialism. Imperialism today needs to be analyzed from the angle of the unstable balance between territorialism and capitalism, which does not mean to blame it on the former as a kind of atavistic logic to echo Josef Schumpeter. What really matters for uh, an understanding of contemporary forms of imperialism are rather the convergences and alliances between territorial powers and capitalist actors that take the simplification of international tensions as an occasion for huge profits and may even push toward such simplification. It remains true today that there is no imperialism that is not capitalist imperialism, and that there is no internationalism that is not anti-imperialist and against the war as well as the proliferation of war regimes. So a first task we face in such conditions is to complexify even more our uh, understanding of processes of pole uh, formation. I stressed uh, the relevance of operations of capital and capitalist actors in such processes, uh, in a way displacing states and great powers from the center uh, of the scene, although they continue to be prominent uh, Actors. Now I need uh, to add uh, another layer, which means the constitutive role of social movements and struggles, or of class struggle writ large, as I like uh, to say, in processes of uh, pole formation. As the common sense goes, there is no class uh, struggle in the international uh, realm. So Brett and I challenge this common sense and we make the case for an analysis of the processes of pole formation that emphasizes uh, the roles played uh, by struggles and social dynamics. This is for us a methodically crucial point that uh, allows shedding light on the contradictions and even antagonists uh, that shape the social uh, dimension of pole formation. In doing so, we are inspired, of course, by recent uh, transnational campaigns, by the movements that uh, in the late 1990s emerged as a powerful counterpart to capitalist globalization between Seattle, Porto Alegre, and Genoa, as well as by processes of circulation of struggles across borders, for instance, in the Occupy cycle in 2011-2013, in the case uh, of the movement for black lives in the US in 2020, but also of the Iranian uprising of 2022-2023 under the Kurdish slogan, Woman, Life, Freedom. But this is only part of the story since uh, we also focus on more elusive forms of struggle as for instance uh, the ones uh, crisscrossing the spaces produced by movements of migration which play pivotal roles in processes of class formation in many parts of the world. It is within uh, this uh, emerging multipolarity and keeping into account the tensions and conflicts that are constitutive of processes of pole formation that the problem and prospects of internationalism must be reframed. 
There is no shortage of uh, research and theoretical work that may help us in the exploration of uh, what we may call these uh, uncharted uh, lands and seas to echo Niccolò Machiavelli. Mm? I'm thinking, for instance, of the notion of critical regionalism elaborated by Gayatri Spivak, among others, with an emphasis on the plural dimensions of the region, or of a book published by Quang Xin Chen in 2010, Asia as Method, where Asia appears as a kaleidoscope of regional spaces traversed by the presence of other continental actors, above all uh, the United States. If we take together uh, the work by Spivak and the work by Quang Xin Chen, uh, you are confronted with uh, at least two features uh, that remain valid to grasp uh, the peculiarity of the emerging spaces of multipolarity. Firstly, they do not share the imagined uh, territorial homogeneity of uh, modern states. They are rather profoundly uneven, heterogeneous, and even fragmented. Secondly, they are not bounded spaces, but rather crisscrossed by global vectors and therefore open to multiple entwinements with other geographical formations. These two aspects uh, have important implications, I think, for any effort to rethink the problem uh, of uh, internationalism. And let me provide uh, a first uh, general framework in this uh, respect. Emerging uh, regional spaces, uh, emerging poles, uh, do not foreshadow a fixed uh, geography. Which means that while they build, they do build the primary reference for the establishment of channels of communication between uh, struggles, uh, the resulting coordinates of political action can be easily multiplied and articulated with uh, each other. Moreover, the deep heterogeneity of such uh, spaces compels uh, to take the problem of translation, translation between different experiences, claims, and languages as a constitutive moment of organizing which becomes even more important to enable an opening toward other global spaces. This is just a sketch of a politics of struggle within and against the processes of pole formation and the emerging multipolar world which remains a word uh, of capital. I do not think we may provide a model for uh, such uh, a politics. Nonetheless, and not only because of the location of this conference, let me quickly turn uh, to the Latin American experiences of the last uh, couple of decades. Although limited and contradictory, those experiences demonstrate at least the potentialities of a regional scale of struggle and political experimentation. If one thinks of the 1980s and 1990s, when military dictatorships in many countries gave way to a process of quote-unquote transition to democracy, Latin America seemed completely caught in the Washington Consensus, which means continued dependency on the United States and further experimentation with the neoliberal policies 
inaugurated amid terror and blood by the Pinochet regime after the 1973 coup in this country. The situation changed quite dramatically and quite suddenly toward the end of the 20th century when a concatenation of uprisings at the regional scale from Ecuador to Bolivia to Argentina was uh, prepared and followed by a proliferation of movements and struggles of a new type in most uh, Latin American countries. Consider that uh, since uh, 1994, the Zapatista rebellion in Mexico had played uh, a fundamental role within this process, uh, providing uh, movements with a new language that circulated across and beyond the region and underscoring the leading role of indigenous movements in uh, the new cycle of uh, struggles and mobilization. The uprisings and movements of the end of the 90s and the early 2000s opened a new regional space. This is, for me, a very important point. They produced a new continental space within which, in the first long decade of the 21st century, new so-called progressive uh, governments were established in many countries uh, and new integration processes uh, were launched along the axis established by President Lula of Brazil and President Chavez of uh, Venezuela. So this is not the place, of course, to make an assessment uh, of such governments whose accomplishments in the fields of social policies against poverty and in some cases in dealing with indigenous claims and decolonization were met by an intensification of extractive projects and by a myriad of compromises with uh, established powers and corporate uh, actors. What uh, matters more now is that Latin America continues to be swept and traversed by dynamics of uprising and struggle that circulate across uh, the region. Just think of the last uh, few years, we have been witnessing a continuity of movements of uprising uh, across Latin America moving from country to country. The huge revolt in Chile in October 2019 that remains a threshold in this country's political history that despite the defeat of the new project of constitution at the referendum of September 2022 and the succeeding turn to the right was soon followed by popular revolts in Ecuador with huge indigenous participation and by mass resistance against the coup in uh, Bolivia. In May 2021, a mass social movement against the fiscal reform in Colombia gave way to a general mobilization against the prevailing social and political system that created the conditions for wider change and uh, for the electoral victory of uh, President uh, Gustavo Petro. To this, we should add that in December 2022, the destitution of President Castillo in Peru was countered by a widespread movement of insurgency led by peasants and indigenous people and violently repressed by security forces. That would be, of course, uh, much more to say about uh, Latin America, about uh, the nested geography of what we can consider an incipient process of pole formation characterized by several regional organizations, by a multiplication of operative and infrastructural spaces of capital, and importantly, 
by the presence in the region of both the US and China. We can hark back uh, to this important topic uh, in the discussion, if uh, you wish. For now, I want uh, to dwell a bit more uh, on a single, although crucially important movement which means on the feminist uh, mobilizations uh, since uh, 2015 in Argentina under the heading uh, Ni Una Menos, not one uh, less. What is uh, striking here, at least for me, are the accelerated pace and the transformative power of the circulation of that movement at the regional scale which led to the emergence of a Latin American dimension of uh, feminist action that has swept many different countries through a politics of translation again of uh, organizational tools and political discourses onto quite heterogeneous material context. Importantly, the new Latin American feminism has produced powerful resonances both in the US and maybe above all in Southern Europe in countries like Italy and Spain. And what our first keynote speaker, Veronica Gago, calls the new feminist international is built upon a dense web of bodies in struggle territorial and subjective specificities, situated practices of anti-colonial and anti-racist politics that defy the limits of nation state geometry without ever becoming abstract. Hmm. Allow me uh, to repeat. I'm not presenting uh, the Latin American experience as a model. Hmm. It is just an example uh, in the way in which uh, Machiavelli again uh, understood examples. In any case, the experience of Niuna Menos has uh, helped me to outline the rough framework I proposed uh, before, centered on processes of organization and communication within the, the regional space of a pole, and on what uh, Brett Nilsson and I call uh, continental intimacies, playing with the title of a remarkable book uh, by Lisa Lowe. Huh? But this is uh, just a rough framework that needs to be tested and modified in other contexts that are no less specific and internally variegated than uh, the Latin American one. Hmm. And nonetheless, there is something in uh, the singular experience of recent uh, Latin American uh, feminist uh, movements that uh, may provide us uh, with uh, an example and a test of uh, the feasibility of uh, the kind of rethinking of internationalism I am uh, starting to propose. To conclude, allow me to hark back uh, to the way in which I framed uh, the problem of internationalism at the very beginning uh, of uh, this lecture. Allow me to uh, open uh, some uh, theoretical and even philosophical problems uh, that are uh, raised by that uh, definition. I spoke, you may remember, of the need to forge a political language capable to address heterogeneous conditions of domination and exploitation in different parts of the world while articulating a common desire for liberation. Simple words, but I am aware that such a formulation raises a panoply of uh, questions. Is it possible to address uh, through a common language the heterogeneity of domination and exploitation? 
and even more radically, maybe, does a common desire for liberation exist at all? Maybe it is easier uh, to uh, start with this uh, latter question, since uh, it is clear that uh, a common desire for liberation does not exist as such, that we are rather confronted in many parts of the world with struggles, efforts, and movements that arise from the clash with systems of domination and exploitation, struggles, efforts, and movements that open cracks in their structure, but do not foreshadow a systematic search for liberation. This should be precisely the task of a new international that whatever its name should work toward the reconstruction of a horizon of life beyond the rule of capital. To demonstrate in a compelling way that such life is possible and desirable should figure prominently in our agenda in the tumultuous transition we are living through. It will not be a manifesto written by armchair philosophers, of course, and it will not be a one-size-fits-all blueprint. When I say that we need to forge a new political language, I'm rather thinking of a collective endeavor rooted in different parts of the world, nurtured by heterogeneous experiences and struggles, and aiming at sketching a set of general principles and concepts to be translated in peculiar ways onto different material and geographical contexts. But what about the heterogeneity of conditions of domination and exploitation we face today? Is it possible to forge a common language to address, to grasp, to critically grasp that heterogeneity? This is a question that haunts, for instance, debates surrounding intersectionality, where, for instance, Patricia Hill Collins proposed to distinguish between oppression and exploitation to come to terms with such heterogeneity. But we can add to these debates the quite different work of David Harvey and Nancy Fraser on the distinctiveness of dispossession or expropriation, once again distinguished from exploitation. I have not the time to address uh, these burning issues, uh, but it was uh, important to me at least uh, to mention them. Let me just add that my own approach to these questions is predicated upon a systematic engagement with the question of uh, difference, which uh, emerges from the debates I could thoroughly mentioned and on a radical rethinking of the notion of exploitation that is too often sidelined and understood in very traditional terms. And taking inspiration for the well, from the well-known and great image of the house of difference employed by Audre Lorde in Zami, I also attempt to reinvent the notion of the multitude to grasp the subjective stakes of the politics of liberation today. But to really conclude, I want to come back to the problem of internationalism and to the task to forge I repeat what I call a common political language capable to resonate in an effective way across regional and continental spaces. It is easy to see that what looms behind such formulation is the vexed question of the universal and uh, universalism. Mm -hmm. There is no need to discuss once again the complicity of uh, European universalism with colonialism, racism, and sexism. This is something I take for granted. Nonetheless, I follow Etienne Balibar when he invites uh, 
us to understand universalism as a terrain of struggle. And Balibar adds that uh, any enunciation of uh, the universal is not a factor of uh, unification of human beings, but rather an element of conflict between and with themselves. You may have noticed that uh, I used uh, several times uh, the verb uh, translate in uh, this lecture, and not by accident, of course. Translation is not a catchword good uh, for flyers or for political manifestos, but it nicely captures uh, the theoretical and political stakes uh, of uh, any, think, uh, any thinking of the problem of uh, internationalism uh, today. This is a question Brett Nilsson and I addressed in Border as Method, mainly drawing inspiration from the work of Naoki Sakai. Once uh, you do not understand translation in merely linguistic terms, and you also raise uh, the Gramscian question of the translatability of concepts and theoretical frameworks against the background of uh, radically heterogeneous material and geographical context, uh, universalism uh, as uh, a terrain of struggle begin to take on uh, concrete dimensions uh, and to become uh, productive. Needless to say, far from being a solution, uh, such uh, a politics of translation uh, builds an engaging and difficult task that must renounce the pitfalls of a search for complete transparency and take seriously the encounter with the untranslatability. Nonetheless, uh, it is a task we should take up with respect both to the critique of heterogeneous conditions of domination and exploitation and to the political establishment of a common desire for liberation, to the forging of a new vision of what Gary Wilder very simply calls the world we wish to see, and to pay tribute to a visionary whose words continue to echo in the present allow me to add that this word will be once again a word to win. Thank you very much. Mm. can have some questions, you can raise your hand and I can go. Thank you, Sandro, for this. Oh, stand up. Lydia Liu from Columbia University. Um, uh, thank you for your attempt to reframe uh, the international. <laughs> um, and um, you mentioned earlier in your talk that you wanted to push the limits, the limits of the geopolitical and the limits of the political. So at which point do they intersect? I mean, other than the historical, the history of colonialism, imperialism, if we're talking about the current situa situation, um, there are a number of areas that you mentioned, for instance, multipolarity, uh, and, uh, heterogeneity, and the importance of translation, the question of difference, and universalism. Now, um, I, I see real potential in this reframing of the international when you take all of these into account. Um, currently, the people who really speak most about multipolarity are players at the state level, right? As, as you mentioned, exactly what do they mean by that? What is the common language? 
is capital the common language uh, in, in this attempt to refashion the world. Um, Everybody is talking about the declining of the U.S. hegemony, but then there is also the presence of U.S. military bases everywhere, right? So um, does the military uh, reach define the limits of the geopolitical and the limits of the political? To what extent, I mean, is it, are we really talking about a changing world? This is a real question, right? Something is becoming unhinged to, uh, in our time. But are we, you know, if you could help us think of, through this philosophically, are we really facing a changing time? Or are we looking at this struggle between China and US, and you mentioned that briefly, um, the kind, are they talking are we talking about differences between these two powers? And there are all kinds of theories about you know, China's rise and all of that, but you only see this in Western media. In other words, if we talk about polarities, differences, a lot you see is the US projection of its own uh, paranoia onto a mirror called China. So China is the mirror on which all kinds of fantasies and phobias are projected, which distort our understanding of the geopolitical and the political. So it's, it seems there's something with the imagination, the lack of imagination, or the, the lack of communicability, so is this something that translation can resolve? We collect a bit, a couple of, yeah. Hmm. Are we going to print? Oh. Alberto Moreiras. Uh, thank you, Sandro. I, <clears throat> I wanted to take up the, the notion of internationalism and set it up against uh, what Deepesh Chakrabarty, a subaltern historian, uh, has proposed in a, in a recent book, Climate of History. He says that uh, we are facing a new regime of historicality, a new regime of history. And he calls it the time of planetarization, uh, no longer the time of globalization. Obviously, he's talking about Anthropocene and climate change. But the thing is, he says, look, this calls for a new politics, this calls for new thought, this calls for even a new existential projection, something that we need to develop, because what is coming alters the conditions of, uh, of uh, history, as such, in, in radical ways. So, given planetarization, not as a site of productionist development, as globalization was, mm -hmm. rather as a site of disaster, as a site of ecological transition, is liberation really the key horizon for that new political language you are talking about? I, I know that this is a very difficult question, okay? Uh, but again, that's my question. Is liberation really the horizon in the face of planetarization, climate disaster, and, and the Anthropocene? Thank you very much, Ulrich Bayer from New York University. I think it follows on your question about the idea of liberation. This afternoon or this morning we heard about scholars seeking refuge really to go to very neoliberal countries actually. So in some ways a question of liberation. I think you also said liberation as a kind of the horizon of what could happen and then you also said at some point, if I remember correctly, but your talk is very rich, liberation from capital. But a lot of people are fleeing toward ultra capital because that is liberation from something else, from economic deprivation. And as a European, you know, the entire discussion whether refugees are classified according for economic or political reasons. So is liberation the goal if people are fleeing into 
capital, if liberation from capital was another instance yet you marked as a possible goal or possible horizon of this new global order. Yeah, Central, very, thank you very much. I've been thinking how you relate uh, the pandemic and the war and your uh, critique of this uh, geopolitical area studies and then uh, the concept of space and then this uh, uh, politics of translations. So I, I think you want to emphasize this uh, current Cold War is like the pandemic. It's uh, strengthening the border control or this uh, contagious uh, nationalistic uh, defense mechanism against uh, the other, okay? So the containment politics is actually functioning, okay? Like uh, Modi <laughs> and US talk and also linking uh, Japan and maybe Australia, I don't know, maybe uh, Philippines, I don't know. But uh, this is uh, currently the, the, the intensification of the border against uh, each other, okay? But that, uh, that would increase uh, the, the, uh, the war, right? The, the, the war is not stopping, it seems, uh, and no, no real uh, politics of translation is possible at the level of real politics. So uh, I know you, you extend uh, uh, Bali Bali's uh, concept of uh, democratization of the border, and also let the inside and outside trying to translate, uh, and we don't think it's a block, right, of, of a space, or a geographical space, but it's a heter heterogeneous element uh, and that needs uh, to be translated. But do we have time for that? Uh, policies of translation on the, uh, the real politics uh, level, do we have enough uh, wisdom uh, of those uh, political leaders who can carry out or carry uh, or practice this uh, yeah, negotiation or peace talk? It seems not, right? So on the level of uh, the, the ground roots uh, uh, from the people, this, uh, we all have our sympathy and em empathetical ground, war, uh, ground root uh, work uh, we can do association of free persons uh, from local to local, translocal, but does, does that, it's not enough. <laughs> or do, do we have time for that? <laughs> okay. I wanted to insist on the. Sorry. <laughs> I wanted to insist on the um, horizon of renovation of internationalism associated with the need of a common language, and that that common language could associate to a politics of translation. Um, so a politic of translation that would be a constitution of the common, which is or the global spaces that are very different, uh, both from the uh, Enlightenment dream of a universal language and form the romantic dream of an atavic original language. Uh, a language of translation uh, that in a certain way, uh, I mean, refuses homogeneity, but also refuses uh, appellation to origins, where the imaginary itself, uh, it appeals rather to Maronism, it appeals to, con uh, to, to mestizage, uh, something that Latin America is constitutive. I mean, we have the Malinchism in Mexico, we have the anthropophagic, uh, idea of translation in Brazil, and, and I could continue. Uh, so I wanted to insist on how going beyond uh, the imaginary itself in terms of the actual performance of translation, uh, where translation doesn't appeal to universal language or to an original language, but rather to, to a process of hosting behavior. Uh, hosting behavior, comportamiento, yeah, yeah. in the sense that what is most difficult to translate is not really the ideal. It can be difficult, but normally when, when we 
the difficult part of translating is to translate the behavior, the style of a language into another language. El comportamiento de un lenguaje en otro. And how that, uh, now uh, relating it to this idea of conmotions, which means moving together, could redefine the way we think about internationalism in a way that you would have to recognize that it's always uh, something that you have to share behavior, that you have to make what is behaved in one part is being behaved in another, uh, which is a very difficult process, and that doesn't have only to, to I mean, that's the difference with translation. Not, it's not a model of communication. It's not only about having the same ideas, but being able to move together. In, uh, even if we have different ideas, to share behavior, which is something that has to do with contagion, has to do with being, it's like dancing. It's something that gets contagious when someone is moving at your side. That's very much to do with conmotions, moving together. So I was wondering how that, re I mean, how can we think internationalism in terms of the those performance, also, in, and, and this is my, my, my last sentence, also in the fact that translation is an operation, especially literary translation, without rules. There's no one way, it's not a perfect way of doing it. Uh, it doesn't appeal totaliza to totalization, either linguistic, socioethical, or constructive. I mean, even in, if, I, if I appeal to Babel, if I may appeal to Babel, this cliche of translation, is in a way the interdiction of the superstructure. I mean, the superstructure can never be finished. It's sort of an asymptotic movement. How can we rethink uh, internationalism, uh, and I'm very much uh, for it, but uh, in those terms, in terms of not sharing a common message, but of uh, being able to behave in a certain common way, even if we think very differently. It has to do also with constructing the space of the common from, from a struggle that might remain there as a struggle, and not uh, waiting till there's a certain homogeneity of ideas uh, to think uh, the possibility of the community. Sorry about the length of my intervention. Thank you. Do we have a time limit? Well, maybe I can start from uh, the last question uh, that allows me uh, to say something more about uh, translation and the way in which I understand uh, translation. As I was uh, mentioning at the end uh, of uh, my talk, uh, um, the work uh, of uh, Naoki Sakai has been uh, particularly important uh, to me uh, in uh, working uh, about uh, translation because, uh, uh, to put it quickly, he kind of emphasizes uh, the ambivalence of uh, translation. Translation can be uh, a tool uh, for state building, can be a tool uh, for nationalism, it can be a tool for capital, that translates human activity onto the homogeneous language of value, but it can also be uh, a weapon uh, for uh, the organization uh, of uh, movements and particularly uh, for uh, a kind of uh, cross-pollination uh, uh, of different uh, movements. Then, I mean, there was a time in which I worked quite a lot uh, from a theoretical and philosophical point of view on uh, translation, but maybe uh, the best way uh, to give uh, an idea of my understanding of uh, uh, translation is uh, uh, to speak a bit about uh, an experience. In the early 2000s, uh, in a moment of uh, uprisings and rebellions in many Latin American countries, uh, I started uh, uh, to uh, go quite regularly to Argentina uh, and to teach there. Uh, at that time, uh, uh, I was part uh, of uh, a discussion in Italy and also beyond Italy about the notion of uh, the multitude. You know. And for us, there was a fundamental opposition 
between uh, the multitude and the people. You know, there is a famous text by Paolo Birno that instantiates uh, this approach in a very effective way. So I come here, everybody speaks of Pueblo, of uh, uh, movimientos populares, everybody speaks of the people, of popular movements. What should I do? At the beginning, uh, I was trying, uh, you know, in a kind of naive way to convince uh, some friends uh, that uh, they had to move uh, from the people to the multitude. But then I quickly realized uh, that it was a boludes. <laughs> it was not particularly intelligent. Uh, and so I started uh, a, a kind of uh, work of translation, first of all for me, you know, and I was able to open uh, the notion of the multitude to uh, many uh, interesting elements that are addressed in uh, uh, Latin America through the language of the people. So for me, this is a good example of a kind of conceptual but also political translation you know, that goes beyond communication because communication presupposes uh, that uh, you understand uh, uh, your interlocutor. It was clear that we didn't understand uh, uh, each other, you know. But this uh, labor of translation has been productive, at least for me, you know. I didn't change anything in... Uh, Argentinian uh, debates, but it was very productive for me because uh, it, uh, uh, it uh, allowed me to test also the limits of a certain understanding of the notion of the multitude. Mm. And you were talking about enlightenment, uh, romanticism. Uh, you know, what uh, I find uh, really thought-provoking uh, in many uh, philosophical uh, elaborations uh, on translation, but also in post-colonial literature, uh, is this idea of the untranslatability. It's sure, I mean, in my discussion with many people who were talking about uh, the people, popular movements in Argentina in the early 2000s, there was a reciprocal untranslatability. But at least in some moments, it was productive. It helped us to move beyond our own uh, uh, ideas, you know. And this is, of course, uh, a, a very uh, insignificant anecdote, but I think it can say something about the way in which also different kinds of movements, different kinds of political actors uh, can uh, uh, stage encounters uh, across continents. And regarding the behaviors, uh, uh, you know, uh, I agree with you, this is uh, uh, a crucial point. You know. Again, arcing back uh, to uh, the feminist movements uh, in uh, Latin America, you know, I had uh, the privilege to participate in some of the first uh, demonstrations in Buenos Aires, and uh, one year later, I saw the same behaviors uh, in Rome, in Italy. So there is a circulation of behaviors that is, of course, uh, spurred, nurtured uh, by emotions. But then there is a moment uh, in which uh, the need for the common language emerges, in a way. Mm. Anyway, I would like to go <laughs> on, but uh, we don't have so uh, much uh, uh, time. But uh, I hope uh, what I just uh, uh, explained about the translation is helpful uh, also uh, to address uh, the questions uh, asked uh, by Lydia. Hmm. You know. I know uh, there are uh, many US military bases uh, in the world. <laughs> this is not particularly new. Hmm. Nonetheless, uh, uh, I have uh, uh, 
the impression, you know, uh, also uh, nurtured uh, by research and study, uh, that uh, we are indeed uh, uh, facing uh, a deep transformation at the global level. You know. I will put it so. You are right, the US uh, uh, project uh, its paranoia. Mm -hmm. The US is very uh, assertive, let's say. You know. mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I have the impression that there is a growing uh, awareness of the fact uh, that the US-led uh, West uh, is just a part of the world. Mm -hmm. And this is something new, you know, because the West uh, used uh, to think of itself as the world in uh, universal terms. Hmm. Even in the 1990s, you know, in the Clinton years. Hmm. Nowadays, I have really the impression, and I could uh, explain why, that uh, uh, there is an awareness of the fact that the West uh, is just a part of the world. There is uh, a, a, a report by uh, an important think tank uh, very close to the European Commission that came out uh, in February, uh, one year after uh, Russia's invasion of uh, Ukraine. And it is a report on uh, uh, global public opinion uh, and the world. I will just uh, mention the title of that uh, report. <laughs> United uh, West, comma, divided from the rest. It's a very mainstream kind uh, of foundation. Hmm? It's not, uh, and I think it nicely captures what, uh, what is going on, or think of uh, the, the very word friend showing. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> French showing is predicated upon the existence uh, of enemies, uh, and enemies are not a rough state because uh, China is not a rough state. What is very important for me uh, is uh, uh, to go beyond the kind of uh, bipolar analysis of the relations between China and the US. Basically, this is the, the main reason why uh, I find the notion of multipolarity helpful you know, because it allows us to see other kind of uh, emerging poles, uh, spaces, uh, and not to focus on uh, the relation between the US uh, and China. I'm convinced that uh, uh, focusing too much on the relation, on the bipolar relation between the US and China, I will put it uh, very quickly, <laughs> is going to lead us to war. Hmm. So also from the point of view of research, of writing, I think uh, it is important to try to, hmm. to challenge this uh, bipolar uh, scheme. Uh, two questions on the notion of liberation. The notion of liberation is not new, of course. I mean, I am uh, aware uh, of that. It has uh, a long... Uh, conceptual history, uh, what I find uh, important is the distinction between uh, emancipation and liberation. Uh, I think liberation is a state. Liberation for me means uh, something more than emancipation, something more than civil rights. <laughs> the capacity, you know, to confront the rule of capital, which does not necessarily mean uh, liberation from capital. Uh, it's not very easy for me to understand <laughs> the meaning of liberation from capital, you know. But uh, struggling uh, within and against uh, the uh, capital relation uh, opens the possibility of liberation, opens the possibility of uh, uh, a political movement uh, that goes beyond emancipation goes beyond civil rights. I am aware of uh, Deepesh Chakrabarti's uh, book. I read it. I discussed it uh, with him. It's, it's a great book. 
by the way, I, I, I skipped uh, a part of the paper where I discussed the notion of the planet, uh, which is a very inspiring uh, uh, notion. I understand why Deepesh uh, criticizes uh, approaches uh, to uh, climate change uh, uh, univocally focused uh, on uh, capital. I understand, but uh, you know my my point uh, uh, when I had uh, uh, the privilege to discuss with him uh, was about uh, uh, the notion of global apartheid, you know that is uh, that has been popularized by the UN, and I was saying uh, you know uh, class struggle. Uh, does not seem to be suspended uh, in the Anthropocene. It remains this, this kind of uh, uh, deep uh, fracture, this set of deep uh, fractures. But I repeated that the notion of uh, uh, the planet uh, is really inspiring and I try to use it uh, uh, to tackle the question of uh, climate change uh, in a way following Chakrabarti's uh, uh, book. Mm. Um, you were talking about people, uh, uh, scholars, uh, that uh, escape uh, uh, from authoritarian regimes uh, and uh, move toward the neoliberal countries, capitalist uh, countries. This is, uh, of course, true. It is important. Uh, maybe for me, uh, even more important uh, is to look uh, at the tens of thousands uh, of common people uh, who migrate uh, toward uh, Europe uh, in the case of uh, my location. And these people, as uh, you may know, uh, too often uh, die in the attempt to uh, challenge uh, the uh, border regime, the European border regime in the Mediterranean. You may know that uh, in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, I mean, it's a huge graveyard. Uh, calculation is 40,000 uh, people died uh, in the last, uh, in the last uh, 10 years, since uh, 2014, you know, so it's something Terrible. Well, uh, often uh, uh, I think of uh, the last pages uh, of uh, Fanon's uh, The Wretched uh, of the Earth. You know where Fanon uh, uh, inside his uh, fellow comrades uh, to leave Europe, to abandon Europe, to uh, establish something completely new. And if you look uh, at uh, migrants and refugees crossing the Mediterranean, uh, it's the other way around. These subaltern people uh, are uh, coming to Europe, uh, are coming to capitalism, are coming uh, to neoliberal countries, you know. My point is that uh, once they are in Europe, uh, if uh, they get there, uh, they encounter the, the capital relation and uh, they become, uh, in a way, uh, caught in that relation. And more often than not, they become also active uh, in uh, labor and social uh, struggles. So I do not have uh, uh, a kind of uh, uh, ideal or moral uh, uh, understanding of capital. Capital for me, I take it from Marx, is a social relation. So uh, this is the reason why I was saying before that uh, liberation from capital, well, sounds good, but uh, I'm not sure to, to be able to figure out uh, what uh, it means. What interests me more are the kind of tensions uh, and struggles generated by the working of the social relation of uh, capital. And to conclude uh, with Joyce's uh, uh, question, uh, it 
may me think uh, about uh, several things. You know, I've been uh, kind of investigating the proliferation of borders, uh, particularly in Europe, uh, uh, in the wake of the outbreak of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. It was kind of amazing, you know, because it was not only the international border that uh, was uh, kind of uh, reinforced, you know. In a way, uh, the home became uh, a uh, border the space, you know. And if you look at the way in which uh, uh, workplaces were organized, uh, particularly in 2020, I mean, it was a continuous proliferation of zones, of border the zones. So, of course, uh, this uh, has to do with the contagion, it has to do with a kind of uh, uh, new hmm, idea of security that is not that new, but it was uh, in a way relaunched. I think that this country and this city are good, uh, are good instances of uh, the ways in which the pandemic reinforced uh, uh, security apparatus, but also a kind of uh, 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 call for security. You know, I was, I was uh, kind of shocked, I don't know if uh, you noticed that, uh, by the attitude of uh, policemen in the very center of, uh, of uh, uh, Santiago. They are very aggressive, you know. I mean, in Italy, it doesn't happen because uh, uh, they, they scare tourists uh, if they are so aggressive. And then I asked a uh, uh, couple of friends who said that it was not so before uh, 2019, you know. So in, in Chile, there was this kind uh, of articulation between the big revolt of October 2019 and then the pandemic that started in March when the revolt was kind of uh, beginning again. Uh, so you see very well this, uh, this uh, issue of security uh, connected to the issue of contagion, but also more generally to this uh, proliferation of uh, borders. Then two more points, uh, because I guess we are late. Um, you were talking also about uh, nationalism, uh, conservatism. Uh, there is something I didn't uh, uh, say before, uh, which means that uh, there is an international of the right. There is an international of the right uh, that uh, uh, plays a very important political uh, uh, role in many countries, including Italy, you know. So this is uh, a reason more to mm, establish new forms of communication and uh, networking uh, at the uh, transnational, transcontinental uh, level. And then you were asking about political leaders, uh, and uh, in particular, uh, you were asking, do we have the time? Well, I hope. <laughs> and I conclude on this optimistic uh, note. <laughs> but thank you very, very much. Thank you, Sandro. That was, that was amazing. It was inspiring. There are lots of more questions, I'm sure, that people will be able to um, needle with you with later. Sure. Um, but thank you very much, and that's the lecture.